Okay. Hello, everyone. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, whatever your time zone may be. Thank you uh, for joining us today for another exciting Power BI Turkey meetup. Uh, today we are together with Michael Kowalski. We're going to talk about uh, best practice rules for Power BI. Uh, for those who don't know Michael, uh, Michael is program manager at Microsoft and also blogging at uh, elegantbi.com. If you are into Power BI, then I strongly suggest you to follow his blog. Uh, it's one of the must follow blogs regarding data related stuff uh, in Microsoft. Uh, a bit of housekeeping, Q&A is open. Uh, you are uh, more than welcome to put your questions uh, into the chat window or you can ask directly by unmuting yourself. Also, the session is being recorded and will be online a week later on our YouTube channel. I will uh, paste the link into the chat window. Hello, Michael. Thanks a lot for joining us today. Without further ado, I'm handing over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Halil. I really appreciate the introduction and uh, great to be everybody. The uh, share my screen. Hello, we'll just confirm that you can see my screen. Yes. OK, great. Yes, you can. Great, thanks so much. And just to echo Halil's comments, you know, if, if folks have questions anytime, I encourage you to, to ask and uh, uh, to make this more interactive. Be happy to take questions uh, throughout the presentation uh, and not just have it be a lecture. Um, so with that, uh, let's get started. So today we'll be talking about the best practice rules um, that we actually launched on the Microsoft Power BI blog uh, some earlier this year. And um, we'll be talking about those rules and, uh, and, and and how you can get started using those rules. So uh, just here, as you can see on my screen, we have this the blog post. And I encourage you, who, those of you who have not uh, read this as of yet, to definitely take a look and, and read this as it kind of goes over in high level uh, the rules. Just to uh, give context, so these these best practice rules, um, you can. And I suggest you to to read you know, documentation and, and videos and articles and blog posts on, on Power BI and tabular modeling. Um, the goal here with these best practice rules was to synthesize a lot of the learnings from those blogs and, and, and videos and articles that, that you can read and watch into a set of rules that are codified that you can run against any tabular model or Power BI model. And um, these rules, there's over 60 of them now, uh, were put together um, not only by, by me, but by folks from the, the Power BI customer advisory team, as well as folks on the Power BI product team and learnings that we've had working with enterprise customers over many, many years. So uh, these rules have been tried and tested and, uh, and, and they provide a good foundation for a first evaluation of, of a model. Um, and I want to also call out that these rules, despite the, the blog post, um, there was some controversy about this, but uh, the blog post is called um, best practice rules to improve your model's performance. The rules are, a lot of the rules are around performance, but some of them are also around just general model best practices for design and aesthetics as well. So it, it's really a holistic uh, set of rules that encompasses many things, not just performance, but like I said, also design and some uh, more aesthetic oriented um, best practices. So uh, with that, uh, I will go over to the GitHub page that actually has the, the rules and, and that's linked here within the blog post. And so on, on GitHub, you can actually, <laughs> uh, this is where you actually download, uh, download the rules. And uh, there's actually two ways to go about that. Uh, one way is to run some code, which is uh, the automated way, and there's also the manual way. Uh, I prefer the automated way, so that's what I will show you now. And just uh, some housekeeping that these best practice rules run through Tabular Editor's best practice analyzer. For those of you who have not downloaded Tabular Editor or are not familiar with it, I suggest that you definitely uh, read more about it and, um, and download it at tabulateditor.com. Uh, but it's critical for running these rules. Uh, Michael, is Tabular Editor the only way to to use these uh, rules? 
Is it possible Currently, to use Power BI desktop to check against those rules? Yeah, so um, I'll actually cover that. So you use Tabular Editor. Uh, Tabular Editor is an open source tool. It's also a commercial tool, a tool with Tabular Editor 3. So this will work with either one of those, but um, this works for any kind of tabular model, whether it's a model you built in Power BI Desktop, you know, Analysis Services, Azure Analysis Services, Power BI Premium. It works for any kind of these models. And so um, you have to have Tabular Editor installed as well, but I'll show you how you can leverage this from Power BI Desktop. Great. Uh, so assuming you have Tabular Editor installed, um, actually, let's just cover that real quick. So uh, if you have, say, a model in Power BI Desktop, like this, this model here is built in Power BI Desktop. Uh, if you go to external tools, you can actually, you'll you'll see Tabular Editor or Tabular Editor 3 if you have that installed as well, where you can actually just click on this, uh, these links, uh, and it will uh, it will open Tabular Editor connected to this model and have all of the metadata and everything loaded for that particular model, and then you can run the rules as normal. So um that's how you would you would uh, you know work with um with power bi uh, a desktop file so as an example i'll just click type editor here and it will pop up uh it's my other screen but it'll pop up this window and just like that i have now this this model um which is all the metadata and tables associated with this power BI desktop model so um for the demo, we're going to be using a uh, uh, another way of connecting to Tabular Editor, which is a, a BIM file. And so uh, here, a uh, BIM file, for those of you who are not familiar, is the kind of metadata file which uh, which stores stores metadata for a tabular model. It's under the hood for a you new know, analysis services, Azure Analysis Services, Power BI Premium, or a Power BI Desktop uh, file. And so again, you can see the same kind of interface here um, that, that that we did in um, we opened the Power BI Desktop model in Tableau Editor. So uh, now that we're here, let's uh, let's uh, load the rules. So if we go back to GitHub, um, you know I like the automated way. So to do that, we can just copy this code here. And paste it into there's two kind of windows here in Tableau Editor, the Expression Editor and Advanced Scripting window. So we're going to open the Advanced Scripting window, and we paste this code. And all we have to do is click Play. That will load the rules. And um, to fully kind of load the rules, actually, you just have to close it out and then reopen Tableau Editor, and then that will actually load the rules. But um, this code just it does it automatically. Uh, so um, I've actually already loaded the rules here, uh, but uh, you know, uh, for those of you, you just click play, close it out, and then reopen Tabular Editor, connect to your model, and you're good to go. Um, and as you can probably kind of see in the code here, this code is formatted to work uh, with both Tabular Editor 2 and Tabular Editor 3. So this code, as well as these rules, whether you have tab editor two or three, uh, you're good to go. So um, that said, uh, you know we update these rules every so often. Uh, can be kind of like every month or every few weeks now, uh, with updates to the rules, making sure that uh, you know fixing any kind of bugs, as well as adding new rules or or making them even better. And so you want to make sure that you're always using the latest version. And so you can just, whenever you have tablet open, you just click, you know, have this copy this code and click play, and you will you will download the latest version. Um, and um, if you don't want to kind of keep on copying this code back and forth, what you can do is you can create what's called a custom action. And to do that, you click uh, this plus sign, and let's just call it uh, load uh, BPA rules. And we'll just choose the model. Click OK. And now let's just delete this. And we can go to now samples, custom actions. And now you see this load BPA rules comes up. We can click that, and we immediately get 
that code that we had here previously. And we can now that this is here, anytime we come in tab editor, we, we can have this ready available and just easily download the latest version. Uh, that being said, I will say if you're already using tab letters best practice analyzer, you need to be a little bit careful because this will overwrite the rules file that you have already. So you want to make sure to back that up uh, so as not to delete any rules that you currently have already. OK, so now that uh, you know we we've loaded the rules, uh, let's see how to actually run the best practice analyzer. So there's there's a few ways to do it. Um, we can go to uh, file preferences and there's this option here for background scan for best practice issues. We can click that and click OK. And what that will do is you see down below here that there's uh, it says there's 523 best practice issues. We can click that and it uh, it shows all of the best practice uh, rules and the the rules that have issues. Um, this is cool because it automatically scans your model every time you make a change, and so uh, you know it always is up to date. Uh, that being said, if you have a larger model, it it may slow down your experience. So for a larger model, it may be best just to do it a different way. So we uncheck this, and we go to tools. Best practice analyzer. And that opens the same dialog. Uh, if we want to rerun the rules, we just click the refresh button here. And um, you know the rules have been rerun. So I like to collapse this so you can see um, you know, all the, the, the rules and uh, the issues that you have. Uh, as you can see here that we've we've broken out the rules into categories. As you can see performance. DAX expressions, error prevention, maintenance, formatting, and the rules are somewhat in a prioritized order. Um, given performance is probably more important than formatting, so if you're looking for, you know, which rule should I focus on first, it's probably going to be a better idea to kind of go from top down, uh, the top from the, the rules at the top, and then work your way down to the rules at the bottom. Um, so let's open a rule and see, uh, you know, see more about it. So uh, we open this rule here. Do not use floating point data types. Um, the reason being is because, uh, well, let's actually find the reason. So if we hover over one of these objects, which you can see as a column uh, there, we see that there's some information which shows up uh, when we hover. Let's uh, let's find out more about that. So. Um, if we go to manage rules, and then we go to rules for the local user, we can find that rule. Right here, click edit rule. And here we get much more information about that particular rule. Um, in fact, this description is the same thing that we found on hover. Um, I'm actually going to go to a different rule. I want to go to um, this rule here. So this rule is is to uh, always uh, to, to use the divide function for division. Um, now, as you can see here, uh, there's some more information. So let's talk about it. Uh, there's this severity. Now, severity in the context of best practice analyzer actually doesn't really have an effect, um, but tabular editor has an ability to deploy a model through the command line, and in that case, the severity does take an effect. When you deploy a model through the command line, you can actually run the best practice rules, best practice analyzer against it, and in that case, if you have a a rule a severity level three or higher that's broken then it will actually fail the deployment. Level two will provide a warning and level one will not provide a warning. It's the, the lowest severity. We have the category. We have the description. Uh, now I recommend, you know, for really all these rules, it's best to read the description. Um, 
you know, I think a lot of folks may just look at the analyzer and just try to fix all these rules, or maybe they don't understand them and they get a little bit frustrated. But so if you come in here and you read the description, and also for a lot of the rules, there's a, a reference article which gives you a lot more context as to why the rule is important and uh, and, and and you know why it's why we have it here. So uh, I highly recommend before actually implementing uh, any rule is to understand more about it by reading the description and reading the reference article. Um, it's really important because a lot of times the the title of the rule itself may not give the full context. So uh, really important here. And you'll also see that uh, the specific objects that the rule applies to, in this case, calculated columns, calculation items and measures. And then you'll see the the code or the, the logic that encapsulates the rule. Now here, uh, for those who are more technically inclined, you can actually uh, you know, use this as, uh, as, as an example and all these rules as examples to potentially create your own rules. Um, you know, there's over 60 rules here and a lot of different uh, techniques on, on how to encapsulate rules. And so these should provide a pretty good um, base for learning by example. That being said, the code here is using dynamic link, uh, which is kind of a take on C sharp. And um, I'm not going to go into detail about that now, but um, I would, for those who want to create their own rules, you can use these as uh, to learn from. Now uh, we see all these potential issues. Now, um, you know how do and we kind of learn more about, like say these, like say these few rules. How do we actually fix the rules? Now some of these rules actually have a way to fix the rule within the best practice analyzer. And so, um, as an example, this rule here. So if we uh, right click on on this object, we get either generate fixed script or apply fix. And um, we can actually even select you know, all of these and do either generate fixed script or apply fix. Let's first do generate fixed script. We click that and it says that the fixed script has been copied to the clipboard. We can paste it into the advanced script editor for review. So click OK. We come over here, the same window we were using previously, and we paste. And it gives us the code. Now this is essentially C sharp, uh, which we can actually run, which will fix the issue. And as you can see here, this is changing the data type of these columns into a decimal. So if we actually come back here and let's navigate to this weight column, we can just do that by double clicking on the on the object, and we can see that it's a floating point or double data type. This is actually going to change all five of these columns. But if you watch this, when we click play, now it's changed to decimal. So this is uh, this column is no longer uh, using a, de a double data type; it's using a decimal, and that is is that's good in this case because it's going to be less. Uh, the precision is 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 less. The de decimal is four decimal places as opposed to a float, which is many more decimal points, which are oftentimes not needed. Again, you want to check to see if um, you can actually do this for your for your column. Uh, a lot of times such precision is not necessary and four decimal points is enough, um, but always good to check uh, you know, with your stakeholders and with your um, your business entity to make sure that um, that, that that this is OK. Um, but this here has has fixed the issue. Now, if we say we did this by mistake, uh, tab editor has a nice feature where we can just uh, control uh, control Z or you know undo as we would do in any other uh, program. And we do that and it goes back to double. Um, you can even do uh, control Y and it goes back, uh, redo. And while we're doing that, I'm just going to show another feature of tab editor. We can do uh, edit and show history. Here, where it actually shows you uh, all the changes that were made 
uh, that we have made so far. In this case, we just ran this script and that these five changes were made within that script. And this, this um, history is not just for making changes related to the best price analyzer, it's for making any changes to have better. So if you make literally hundreds of changes in your model, uh, it will save a history of all those changes here. Um, Every time you save Tableau Editor and you close it and you reopen the model, this history will be cleared out. But uh, uh, you know, while you're working in it, it's a good good way to kind of come back and see uh, things that you've done. So if we refresh this, now we'll see that that rule has actually disappeared because we fixed all of the objects associated with that particular rule. Now, I, I mentioned that uh, you know you should probably go as far as priority to go from top down. That performance is uh, going to be the rules around performance in that category are probably going to be more important than the rules regarding uh, formatting. And that's the case in in, in many times. However, there are certain dependencies within um, within uh, some of these uh, rules. And uh, I'd like to articulate uh, that 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 here. So there's a few rules here uh, which are 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 quite important. Uh, one of them is this rule: remove unnecessary columns, which actually here highlights 53 columns that we could remove, which would not impact the model. Um, and we also have this rule here: set is available in MDX to false on non-attribute columns, which is also a really important rule. Um, and we have, you know, other rules say, um, come in here, show you, around, say, formatting, which seem pretty innocuous. Say, for example, hide foreign keys. You know, you're saying, like, how, sh how is this going to impact performance? Hiding a column, like, shouldn't impact performance, and it, it doesn't. Um, or say hide fact table columns. Again, that alone doesn't impact performance. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's generally a best practice for sure, but uh, you, you can't argue it's going to improve performance. However, here's the thing, is that if we look at, um, say, the rule for remove unnecessary columns, This rule actually, as you can see in this first line, relies on either the column being hidden or the table being hidden. Because if the table's hidden, the column's also hidden. Um, and so if we don't hide, uh, say, fact table columns or foreign keys, then this, this rule will not be effective at all. In a lot of cases, I see models where no columns are hidden. Everything is visible. and that's not really following best practices. And then if, if you do that, then you won't be able to take advantage of these rules because it's, you know, not every column should be visible. In fact, you know, foreign keys and uh, fact table columns should always be hidden. That's why we have rules for them. Um, and uh, the other rule I was talking about is the set is available in index to false. And that rule, uh, as you can see, also relies on the columns being hidden or the table being hidden. So these two rules will be will not be effective at all if you don't follow the other two rules. So in a way, you could say that those two formatting rules actually do impact performance because um, they will not allow you to take advantage of other rules which are directly related to performance. So with that, I just want to give the kind of meta point here that not to take any particular rule too lightly because uh, it may have more of an impact than you think. I want to go over, uh, you know, we don't have time to go over all the rules. Um, if you have questions about particular rules, you know, feel free to, to, to let me know. Um, but to kind of go over some uh, some more a bit more complicated rules that don't have these fixes 
I mentioned, you know, that one rule has the the fix uh, available, um, but uh, other rules may not have that. Actually, I realized I that I. Uh, uh, um, forgot to uh, to share that uh, I just undid these changes regarding the. Um, regarding the uh, this, this particular rule here, but that we showed the generate fix script, but I didn't show the apply fix. So apply fix. Um, does the same thing that generate fix script does, only it actually runs that code without you seeing the code. So. Um, it's um, uh, what I would suggest is first uh, process here. First, go and understand the rule by going to manage rules and understand the, the understand the description and read the article associated with it, if there is one. Then, if you wanted to apply the fix, first generate the fix script and see what the fix is actually doing. And if once you understand that, you can run it. And then, only then, can you apply the fix. But I would not suggest just blatantly going through your model and applying the fix. Um, it, it may get you into trouble. I mean, the goal here is not to get everything to zero, for there to be zero objects in violation. You know, there may be cases where you, know, you, you, you have a column that needs to be in a float uh, data type, and, um, and you shouldn't apply the fix. And in that case, what you can do, say the weight column uh, shouldn't be like should should be floating point and you don't want to you don't want the rule keep reminding you to to fix it you can just ignore item and if we ignore it it'll just remove it from this uh from here uh without having fixed it um and it won't come back um so uh just so you know you can um um yeah, you can also click this little button here to do the same thing. Um, but uh, so not all the rules have this apply fix or generate fix script. Some of them don't. In fact, most rules don't um, because tabular editor only allows you to fix things that are relatively simple. And that's done because you, you don't want. Uh, it's kind of protecting you from yourself uh, in that. Uh, potentially putting any kind of malicious code within the fix script. Uh, so we want to keep it. Uh, uh, keep it simpler. Um, so let's go over a, a bit more complicated rule. Uh, so here. Going to go to this rule called filter column values, the proper syntax. Now let's get a better understanding of that particular rule. So we come here. We find the rule here, edit the rule. And so. The rule says instead of using this pattern, filter table uh, table column value for the filter parameters of a calculate or calculate table function use one of the options below and if we go to the ones below we see that these are two better options and there's also a few articles linked so again this is a bit more complicated rule but let's actually jump into you can see like this is the current uh, the current expression for filtering, which should not be done. And these two are the better ones to use. And so if we we can just say double click. On this particular uh, measure, we come to the expression editor and we see that pattern filter table table column equals value. And so if we want to fix this, we saw that there's two ways to do it. One is just table column equals value, or one is keep filters and then that same thing. So if we just remove this, delete this, and we don't need this anymore, we click save. We come back here and we refresh this. And that's now gone. So we fix that issue. And this is a, a common issue that we see across customers is that this filtering pattern of using fil the, the filter function for simple filters like this. Um, ironically, the filter function is not to be used and it, although it can be used, the performance is not as good as if you do it like this or with uh, keep filters. 
So again, this is a implementation of a more advanced rule um, that doesn't have a particular just uh, fix uh, fix script uh, associated with it. Um, but again, we can fix it by going into the manage rules, looking at that particular uh, looking at that particular um, rule and um, and fixing it. So um, and that's again why it's so important to go through and read the descriptions, read the articles to understand that context. It will allow you to be able to fix a lot more of, of these rules and take advantage of, of all the rules. Now there are additional rules that are that are loaded here, which we can take advantage of in, a, in another way, another capacity. So, um, and I'll show you that right now. So if we go back to the GitHub page, we come down to this notes. We'll actually see that there are these five rules which require running an additional script in order to take advantage of them. And this is really important because um, these are a bit more advanced rules, but they're 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 really important. So, um, but these rules they rely on Vertipack Analyzer data. And for those of you who are not familiar with Vertipack Analyzer, it's a tool created by SQL BI, which runs in DAX Studio, another open source uh, tool that shows you information around uh, your actual data. So you know, how many uh, rows are in a table, how many, your cardinality of columns, like how many unique values are in a particular column. And this is really important information that once we have it, we can do some more advanced things and, and uh, really to try to fine tune the model. So there's two ways to load Vertipack Analyzer data into Tableau Editor for your model. And those are shown here. Uh, you know, one way is to load it when you're connected directly to a server. Another way is when you're connected to a Vertipack Analyzer file. And there's, I have blog posts on each one. Uh, that's where the instruction links go. And then the scripts actually go to the, the script that you run. So I'm going to show you how to do it for this, this first way. So if we click on this uh, script, it will open up the script here. And uh, just don't be intimidated by the length of code here. It's just a copy paste. So we'll click on raw and we will copy all this code. And we're going to navigate over to um, Tableau Editor, a, a new window. And here we're going to connect, I'm in this case connecting to a uh, SQL Server Analysis Service instance on my uh, local machine. And um, because as I said, this script runs when you're connected live against a uh, Analysis Service instance. Uh, it won't work if you're connected just to a say a BIM file. Um, if you open up uh, Tableau Editor through Power BI Desktop as an external tool, it will uh, it will also work because underneath the hood of Power BI Desktop is analysis services running. So again, we go to this advanced scripting window and we paste in the code here, and we just click play. After clicking play. We can let's just navigate to a particular table. Show you what it's actually done. If we open up these annotations. We'll see that there's these new annotations which are created. They all have underscore uh, Vertipack, uh, Vertipack underscore something. So this says Vertipack row count. It says you know how many rows are in that particular table, the table size in bytes, and then here it says the percentage. Uh, that this table makes up of the entire model. So this actually this table represents 49% in bytes of the whole model. So if there's a place to optimize the model, it's probably going to be this table. Now, once we are armed with this information, we have this here in Tableau Editor, we can take advantage of those rules. Again, we'll just navigate back. 
these five rules. Um, and I'm going to highlight this particular rule. Actually, we launched a, a new version of the best practice rules just last week, which incorporated this. So for those of you who uh, um, you may not know what a referential, in, referential integrity violation is, uh, but a referential integrity violation is if you're familiar with the, the, the blank row, you may have a, a column in a in a, uh, a slicer in Power BI Desktop, which shows a, a blank row. Um, it's it it's can be quite annoying, and sometimes you want to figure out like how do we solve that blank row issue, um, and fixing the re referential integrity violation will uh, will do that. So we can come in here and refresh the best practice analyzer collapse. And we will actually see that under maintenance. That we actually have a referential integrity violation and it shows you it's all due to relationships. So essentially the. Channel key in the fact sales quota table contains a value that is not in the dim channel dimension. So that's actually causing the issue. So this highlights the relationship so you can go back into your data warehouse, you can go back into your actual data and uh, fix the issue. Knowing that there's an, there's an issue between these two tables. If you want to see more about that rule, we can come in and uh, under maintenance, we can find that rule. And there's quite a bit of information here to help you understand um, the context of this particular rule and also a an, an, uh, reference article which goes into much more detail about why this rule is important. Uh, highly recommend doing that. Um, now this rule to implement it here in, in the best press analyzer it's only possible by running the this vertebrae analyzer script um, without having that data inside of tablet editor store these annotations which by the way, have no other effect on the model. So you don't have to worry about them having any kind of ill effects on the model. It affects it in no way. Uh, they're just there basically as notes to to reference, to be referenced by the best practice analyzer. Um, but the, this, uh, this is only really possible by running this script and having that information here in Tabular Editor. That being said, the Vertipec analyzer in Tablet Editor has even more of an impact. Some folks they want to know, um, you know, how much can we, what's can we actually quantify the savings that are gained by following these best practice rules? And um, it's hard to do that. Um, I mean, you know, improving your DAX, it's hard to say it's going to improve like you know two times, three times. 20%, 10% or following these rules, it's tough to say, but there are two rules which we managed to do this. And I will, there's actually two rules that we talked about previously, um, which will just open up here. One rule is this uh, remove unnecessary columns. And the other rule is the set is available in MDX to false. For those two rules, we can actually quantify the savings. Now, the savings here is not in performance speed. The savings that we're going to quantify is number of bytes that we can save by following these particular rules. So, if we come back to the GitHub page, we can actually go to here where I have a link to this post I made for quantifying the savings of following specific best practice rules. So if we go here, we can actually find more information on how we can quantify the savings for these particular rules. I mentioned those two rules and here they are. And these two uh, links are links to the scripts that actually uh, quantify this. So, and again, this is only possible by adding you know, 
the tabular or the vertex analyzer data into tabular editor, which is done by these two scripts, same links as I have in GitHub. So let's do it for removing necessary columns. We'll click this and gives us this script. Again, don't be intimidated by the code. We just copy and paste. Um, so go back here, copied it, and we paste it. And we just click play. Now, the first piece of information here is the total number of bytes that we will save if we remove all of the columns, which the best practice analyzer tells us to remove. But for folks who want more priority, you know, how do we prioritize that? So we close that, and here we get a list of all the columns and the number of bytes that they take up currently. So that would indicate the number of bytes that we would save if we remove them. So we can just copy this to the clipboard, close it, take Excel, paste it, filter it, largest to smallest. And here we have a prioritized list of removing these columns will give us uh, the most savings. So in this case, removing this online sales key would save us the most. And so you know, here we can actually quantify how much we're going to save, which you know will reduce our the, the, the memory footprint of our model, make our model uh, process faster. And by reducing the, the memory footprint, will potentially allow us to even save money by uh, having uh, a smaller uh, a smaller machine. So, you know, a lot of benefits can be gained here from Best Price Analyzer. It's not just about improving performance, but potentially also cost savings. I want to also uh, show you uh, another way to run the best practice analyzer. Um, we've we've talked about how you can you know do it here through tools, best practice analyzer. You can also do the file preferences and do the background scan. There's another way to, to do this and um, have a, a blog post on that as well. Um, and a GitHub repository which has um, the code for doing that. Uh, and we'll we'll share this uh, GitHub repository so you can you can take a look at it. Um, but it's this script here called export BPA results. So if we click that, we can again copy this code. So, you know, this code does not rely on vertebrae analyzers, so we can run this at any time uh, on, a, on a on a model that's connected to a, to a live server or on a BIM file. So um, all we do is we click play. And so this gives us the output of the best price analyzer that we can actually copy. Close this out. We'll take our Excel, paste this here. And here we have a more uh, physical, shall we say, uh, version of the best practice analyzer results. So for those of you who want to, you know, say filter and find, you know, only severity three rules and um, that have a, you know, say have a fixed expression, you can find that here and do kind of some more investigation this way. Or if you want to create some kind of reporting on your the best price analyzer results, this is also a, a way to do that by, by being able to actually export the results out of tabular editor and into something like Excel or another tool. Just one, uh, you know, one extra way to, um, to interact with the best practice analyzer and um, best practice rules.
And so with that, I, I'm just going to pause and uh, you know see any any questions. We don't have any question yet. Uh, please feel free to ask any kind of question you might have. Come on, guys. <laughs> uh, what is your top Maybe three? Maybe I can ask. Uh, sorry, sorry for the interruption. Uh, these are really cool and great features. Uh, first of all, and is there any plan to add some of them or all of them to Power BI Desktop in long uh, future or short future? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, and uh, a lot of folks ask the same question. Um, currently, um, it's it's uh, it you know we actually we can't really talk about that. Um, it's it's uh, you know, but right now uh, this is in Tableau Editor, and mm -hmm. uh, you know it's fully accessible for folks um, you know to use whether they have a model in Power BI Desktop or mm -hmm. uh, or you know or in Analysis Services. So um, you know, we want to encourage folks to to download Tablet Editor. You know, it's it's you can use the open source version. You don't have to use the paid version. Of course, it works for the paid version as well. Um, but uh, you know, this this is it's it's fully usable uh, for for folks Perfect. in the tabular and Power BI space. Thank you. I agree with Mustafa. Some of those rules should be embedded into Power BI Desktop into. Uh, yes, so for, especially for beginner users, it, in order to make yeah, it, uh, them sure they are going on correct way. Because after you created very big model, it is very difficult to go back and correct. Especially for beginners, maybe some simple rules can be added. I guess it's it's a great a great idea. In fact, if you if you have that opinion, uh, feel free to. Uh, Posted, you know, on I kind of forgot to mention here, uh, but on on GitHub, um, on the analysis services GitHub page, you can create uh, you can create an issue, um, and it, you know you can also submit uh, feedback. So if these rules are, are helping you, and you also want to tell us that hey, we like these rules, but we would like them better if they were in Power BI Desktop. We would love to hear that feedback, and the more feedback that we have about that, then the more momentum there can be, um, more customers talking about it, then the more momentum there can be towards getting into the product itself. So um, you can either submit an issue or uh, on GitHub, or you can email us feedback at this PBI best practice at Microsoft.com. And feedback there is taken, you know, very seriously, and uh, you know we would love to hear from you. That these rules are helping you, and you know if you would like this in Power BI Desktop. Perfect. Thank you. Good to know. And, and um, while I mentioned, I also want to just uh, I'd love to get more questions, but uh, I realized I didn't mention this. But uh, you know we've been launching new versions of of this. We first released the best practice rules in February, and if you come down to the bottom of the GitHub page, you can actually see the version history where we first launched the rules in February and all the different versions since then of adding new rules, fixing rules, um, uh, you know, making them better. So we've had quite a few versions since then, and I can tell you that there's there's more stuff coming up. Uh, I, in fact, I have new rules which um, will be publishing um, pretty soon here. So I want you to, to, want to encourage folks to Come back here and look for these new versions because uh, we're continuously pu continuously publishing new rules as we work with more customers and we you know learn uh, you know more techniques for codifying these rules and uh, you know more kind of issues that happen frequently. Actually, in my opinion, those external tools, without those external tools like Tabular Editor and Artifact Analyzer, we would be lost definitely. But uh, it's it's also a struggling point for new starters. 
so 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 that we we have to or maybe it's good to have a list of uh, rules which are achievable in a much easier way for new starters. Yeah, I mean, it. it not all the rules are, are simple, and that's why we've put forth the descriptions and the articles uh, which give a much greater context to that particular rule. If there's a rule that you don't understand, you say, hey, this doesn't make sense. No, submit an issue and let us know. And we'll, you know, we'll come back to you and 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 give you more context for that rule. Explain it better and 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 make the tool better. So, if there's something you don't understand, reach out to us and we'll try to help you. Um, and we want to make this as friendly as possible. And you know, we don't don't want it just for experts, um, mm -hmm. where you have to have such a deep understanding of of Tabular and Power BI to actually be able to use this. We want it to be uh, to even have more difficult concepts to be more graspable because there's documentation, because there's context given. Uh, so if, if the current description and article is not enough and it should be uh, supported with additional context, then we would love to know that and not just help you, but if you tell us, we can also help other folks too. Okay, any other question from the audience? Okay, Michael, uh, my question, other than having too many unnecessary columns in model, and if we have a proper uh, star schema in our model, what is your top three the most ugly violations in terms of performance. <laughs> you know, it was funny because it's funny you mentioned that because I was thinking yesterday, like, should I make a top <laughs> 10? Top 10, uh, like, best, the best, best practice rules to follow or, like, exactly. things not to do. Um, I actually have a blog post on my blog, elegantbi.com, which goes over what I think are the top 10 uh, things people do wrong the mistakes in, in Power BI and the best practice fixes. And oddly enough, almost all of those, I believe, are encapsulated into best practice rules. So, um, and, and there are things like, uh, uh, things like with necessary columns, uh, the, there's, a, there's a rule uh, around the divide function, which is, which is important. Um, and that's not just for uh, performance, but it's also for uh, not having errors. Um, there's rules around, um, you know, bi-directional relationships and main-to-main -main relationships. Oftentimes, folks use those without maybe understanding the full context of what they do, both uh, what they do and the performance degradation that may come with it. So there's several rules around that. Um, you know, things like, uh, simple things like having a date table. Find too many models that don't have a date table. A, a, a true table marks as a date table. And um, that's an issue because every model should have a date table. Uh, and so very simple um, to do. and. There's a rule around that. Um, for those using Power Query, there's a rule around minimizing the Power Query, Power Query transformations. Uh, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. Uh, and a lot of those transformations, if you can do them in the data warehouse, it, it will be um, more effective and better performing. So uh, that's what that rule is all about. Um, you know, often see tons of calculated columns and uh, calculated tables. And there's some cases where calculated columns are um, necessary, but in most cases, they're not. And uh, just regular data columns are that you bring in with just naturally from your data warehouse are, are much 
are, are much, much better. They compress better, they take up less space, and they take less time to process. And um, it also means that your data is farther upstream. Your logic is upstream. And whenever you can have business logic pushed upstream, it's going to be better. So uh, those are some some rules uh, which I think are, are, are really important, um, which are generally I think pretty easy to follow. So. OK, there is one question regarding uh, privacy mismatches. Will there be a rule to capture privacy mismatches if we have different data sources with different privacy levels? Sometimes you get refresh time errors. By privacy, do you mean, uh, can you clarify or, that? Do they mean like security or access to? Uh, organizational, uh, the, the privacy levels that we use in while we get ah. uh, the data. Do you, do you mean like the sense like the uh, do you mean like this sensitivity label here that you have uh, in Power BI? Or what what exactly do you mean by privacy? So, sorry, just, I think it's a question sorry. from Gopal. Uh, go on, please. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, it is uh, in the uh, Power Query. Power Query, you have uh, uh, privacy options where you say the data source is uh, like organization level or uh, like you said, the privacy level of uh, so that uh, data sources doesn't mix. So uh, many a time uh, when uh, there is an, uh, if you don't set it properly, then at the time of refresh, you get the error uh, saying that ah. uh, you have to rebuild the, uh, rebuild the uh, uh, query because uh, data sources are, you know, the levels are not same. Right? So can we capture that uh, beforehand itself so that, you know, we don't, you know, finally publish and then we get the refresh error when we try to refresh it. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, there's there's no rule around that per se. Um, and I'm not sure. Well, maybe what I suggest here is create an issue on GitHub and uh, maybe we can have a discussion there. I, honestly, I'm not I'm not quite sure if that. Uh, the, if that would be relevant for the best practice analyzer. Um, because it's not, it, it made, it made, and I'm not sure necessarily how to capture that. So, we'll, create an issue on GitHub and, and maybe you can take it from there. Um, yeah. So, sure. yes. One more fact, comment from my side. Yeah. Uh, in the recent Tableau 3 session, uh, similar questions are came. Regarding Power Query stages, uh, is there any uh, possibility to uh, edit Power Query queries in Tableau Editor? And uh, response was the same uh, because there is no API to edit these stages yet. Uh, we can edit or extract information from Beam file currently regarding uh, DAX part or model part, but this Power Query part is still not reachable as far as I know. Of course, maybe there can be ways to do this. Yeah, that's correct. There's uh, that's that's limited. There's no Power Query editor inside of uh, Tab Editor because that uh, API has not been exposed uh, publicly. Um, so yeah, um, there's no no news on that. OK, there is one question about one of the attributes is available in MDX. Is that only available in Tableau models, analysis service Tableau models, or is it also available in Power BI desktop models as well? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so uh, one thing I want to highlight here is that if you're modifying a Power BI desktop um, uh, model, um, there, with external tools, there's only certain support operations, uh, and there's a there's a link. Like we can provide a link for that. Um, but uh, it's it's uh, generally like, you know measures, uh, calculated calculation groups, translations. Um, but uh, say like modifying tables or columns, more structural things. Uh, those are are not uh, feasible yet um, in external tools. So you have to be careful with the things that you do. Um, but if you go to File Preferences, 
we have this checkbox for allow unsupported Power BI features experimental. So this, if we check this, it will actually allow you to make changes that may not be supported in, in um, going back into Power BI desktop. So you have to be careful for that. Um, is available in NDX is a column property. So um, because it's a column property, I'm not sure that it's uh, that it's it's uh, supported. Um, so what I would do is I would make sure to back up your uh, Power BI desktop file, and then you can try you know running this rule and applying the fix to the columns it suggests, and then saving that to a new Power BI desktop file, trying to publish that some and see if it works. Um, it, it may work. Uh, so. Uh, but I'm not sure because it's it's uh, not in this list of supported um, supported structures. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, any further question from the audience? Your last chances. I think uh, there won't be further questions. Thanks a lot, Michael. That was uh, that was hell of a session. Th thank you for creating those best practice rules. It's invaluable for many of us. Absolutely. Uh, thanks so much for having me. And uh, yeah, um, thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot. Uh, it was our pleasure meeting you, hosting you. We hope to see you soon. Later on for another uh, session. Definitely. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks a lot. Uh, see you later. Okay. Take care. You too. Bye bye.